So <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they probably correct, not Midwestern pronunciation. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, it would help you distinguish the one from the other, I guess. Um, and he's going to be talking about effective field theory, and in particular, the standard model effective field theory. All right, please take it away. All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, uh, as introduced, uh, this is me, Adam, I'm talking to you about effective field theory. So um, uh, a couple of things I want to say just before launching in. First, thanks to you know organizers for having me. Uh, TASI is a great uh, thing that uh, every theoretical physicist knows about and raves about. Uh, personally, I was TASI year 2006. So I was Tassi mates with uh, Donald O'Connell, who taught you amplitude. And uh, Tassi is really a, a special thing. You form a connection with people. Uh, you know, I could, if I ran into Donald at any point, I would, you know, be able to stop and have a beer just from that one intense experience with him. Uh, so I really uh, hope that you guys managed to make the same sort of connections here, despite the circumstances that we're in. Uh, I think there's been lots of efforts for you to do that. And uh, I, I hope uh, going forward, you maintain them. Uh, and if you run into me ever, please say, hey, you know, sorry to toss you or whatever. I mean, that's also part of it is getting to know some of the other random people in the field. Um, so yes, effective field theory is also a wonderful topic. I'm delighted to talk about it, um, mostly because the best way to learn anything is to have to teach it. So I've learned a lot in the last little bit reviewing uh, some things in order to, in order to talk to you. Uh, obviously, uh, effective field theory is some just ocean of material and my individual contribution through working on it in the years is a tiny drop. So most of what I'm going to say, or a lot of it, is, uh, is can be found in lots of references, uh, which are, you know, super motivating for me and lots of stuff is going to be taken either directly from there or sort of modified and, you know, scooped up and combined with other stuff. Um, so we've got some here, uh, as we were sort of chatting beforehand, these lectures were, you know, Sort of the original first time uh, sort of EFT, standard model EFT stuff was um, in a TASI lecture that I could find. And then some more recent ones, I'll sort of refer to them back and forth. Um, and uh, I've got a, um, well, I guess we can, we can go ahead. Uh, one thing I'll say is I've sort of compiled, I'll put everything up online, obviously, as other lecturers have been doing. But what I've sort of organized things is each lecture, I'll have a supplement. Too. And supplement mostly, you know, that's exercises of stuff that you might want to do if you say, hey, this is particularly interesting. Let me jump in and, and try and get my, my feet wet at it. It will also have useful formula. I am afraid to tell you that uh, we are going to have to do some loop stuff because some of the really important effects uh, or, you know, motivations behind EFTs are, you know, how loops work with them. Uh, I also want to thank all of you. I remember TASI being a totally exhausting experience. You guys have listened to, I don't know how many, it's four and a half hours of Zoom per day for multiple days. Uh, so I really thank you for your uh, attention here. And uh, this webinar format is a little bit uh, unfamiliar to me. So if you have questions, please jump in. Uh, the very worst that will happen is I will say, I don't know, and I'll get back to you. But uh, that will really help slow me down and keep in touch with everybody. Because the hardest thing I find about lecturing this format is gauging how well people are following please give me some input. Um, ah, yes. I don't know how many of you are crossword Scrabble enthusiasts, but an eft is a baby newt. So I cannot help but every time reading about effective field theory, everything just thinking about, you know, weird lizards or amphibians. So that's just, uh, <laughs> if you learn nothing, you learn that. Um, here's a rough outline, obviously super rough, Depends how fast I go, how many questions you have, what you want to know more about, what you know less about, etc. So today we'll talk a lot about just effective field theory for quantum field theory, motivations and key terms. One of the key terms is going to be matching how we do that. Uh, and then something that uh, I want to highlight that isn't often highlighted as much is really sort of redundancies in effective field theory. Two and three lectures will be improving uh, EFT description. That's going to involve RGs. That's where we're going to have to bring in our loops. We're going to talk about better matching. We're going to have to take a step back and really do a deep uh, dive into what's really in a loop. What does a loop mean? Uh, you, I think you're contractually obliged if talking about EFTs in the standard model. You have to talk about the EFT perspective on the hierarchy problem, a problem we all hear about, the problem we often sort of 
you know, have the spirit of correct, but uh, this will, I, I hopefully really nail down how to say it absolutely correctly. Then the uh, sort of the EFT I know about the best is the SMEFT, it's sort of an ugly term, but the standard model EFT, that's viewing the standard model as an effective field theory, which I'll get to. Uh, uh, that's all sort of, not, I don't want to say old because it's not, but uh, if there's time or particularly if people are interested in discussions, coffee breaks, whatever, I, I've got some own stuff on new ideas in effective field theory. Uh, there's lots of new ideas. The one I know about best is operator counting. So if that's something that's interesting or if I manage to you know, breeze through, uh, something we'll get to. So, all right, with that long-winded introduction, let's begin. So the, the core concept in effective field theory is something that we know it's just true in our gut. So the core concept is that heavy physics should decouple. And we know this. All right, when you're sitting there in quantum mechanics class, and you calculate the spectrum of hydrogen, you're not worried about the top core. Right? That physics shouldn't come in or it should come in with only a very, 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 very small effect. Heavy physics should be able to ignore. At the same time, it's not just a quantum, quantum thing, right? The guy out there or the person out there building houses does not care what uh, atomic physics was. Right? You don't need to know all those details. Heavy physics should decouple. So it's intuitive. We know this. We want to make this same concept that's deep in our you know, instincts work for field theory. Another way of saying this, which is also, I'll try and sort of distinguish this. One is this heavy physics decouples. A second way of saying the same physics or this uh, same message is you don't need the ultimate theory in order to calculate. That's the people out there being building houses. They don't need to know atomic physics, right? As long as they know the properties and materials you're working with, it's fine. So these are EFT in a nutshell. We want to make this idea concrete works for quantum field theory. So these core ideas, the ideas hold in QFT, but they're a little bit more subtle. If we start to think about QFT, one of the complications that we involve is I could have some process like this Right. My, my um, cartoons will get a little better as we go with time, hopefully. I uh, say, all right, that's fine. I've got some, this could be some scattering process. But, you know, we're to dress this up with a loop. The way that we think about this in field theory is, look, that loop involves an integral over all momentum. So even though this process, this might be, you know, E plus E minus scattering at uh, some low energy experiment, that loop involves all the momentum, all the way up to however high we can think of and we tend to try and not think about that. Uh, so that kind of goes against this idea of heavy physics decoupling. This is a subtlety, we can deal with this. One of the main messages of this set of lectures is that this is not a problem. We can work with this. We can still have these core concepts hold in quantum field theory. So hold and they can also be done systematically. And now I'll get to a little bit more clear about what exactly all that means as we go. So let's imagine we're, we're thinking about the standard model. You can do EFTs all over the place. And part of this first lecture will be sort of introducing you to at least very, you know, waving hello to lots of effective field theories. But let's think about the standard model. And the standard model, I'm also going to draw this graph about a billion times. We can think about energies, right? And we've got, you know, top mass up here, and you know, there's Higgs, W, uh, Z, you know, B, et cetera. Way down here, I've got electrons. All right? And, you know, there's all sorts of states in between. So let's imagine I'm interested in, in physics down here. Exactly the blob that I drew right there. We can calculate in the full standard model, all right? That's gonna involve, all right, there'll be some tree level diagrams. If this was an electron, 
this could be a photon, but you know, there's also heavy particles involved there, the Z. And then I start uh, adding in loops and I could have all sorts of particles running around the loop and I could get more complicated. So we all know how to calculate it in the standard model. And we've all at least had a little practice doing loops, but uh, we could think about the entire standard model running around these loops, right? Colored stuff's obviously not gonna come in right away. If I draw enough loops though, they will. So what's the problem with doing things this way? Right, we're trying to sort of make connection with these core concepts up here. The problem with doing things this way is, well, this is super complicated. I've got to keep track of all the particles in the standard model if I want to do this. I don't just need to know electrons. I have to know Z, W, top, et cetera. Complicated means lots of particles. Clearly lots of diagrams, all right? And diagrams are a pain. The more diagrams, the more chances you are gonna screw something up, at least if you're like me. Uh, more scales. The scales and the problem, if I'm down here, you would think physics is governed by electrons. But at least if I start looking at these kind of graphs, it looks like I could have tops, Higgses, introducing a whole bunch of scales in the problem and really, whole process of effective field theory is to try and do things one scale at a time. Another thing that can come up if you're doing it uh, in a full standard model here, standard model really is just a, a toy example here, is you could have possible large logs. Right? Take a diagram like this. I've just drawn a cartoon. When it's important, I'll get more specific. This could have some couplings and a log of some of the ratios that are involved. All right. Sure, if I'm including the whole standard model, there's top quarks and loops. And another low scale in the problem is electrons. But I could have a log like this that isn't super small, multiplying a coupling. And if my, this is the sort of thing that shows up at loop level, if this starts to be big, meaning not something I can totally neglect, then it makes, perturbation theory, not so great. I would have to include more and more and more loops in order to get control. So we'd like to get free of all of these headaches, the tons of diagrams and scales, the potential large logs. This is what working in effective field theory does. So effective field theory or quantum field theory. So this was just sort of our backdrop. We can all imagine, we've all sitting there, opened a field theory textbook and had to try and work through a problem like this. The effective field theory approach for quantum field theory just says, we're going to replace, uh, I'm gonna call L full. Now here, the full theory was the standard model, but we'll get, it doesn't have to be just a standard model. With a theory that I'm gonna call the effective theory that has only the light degrees of freedom. So if our full theory is a standard model, it's got Higgs top W, charm B, et cetera. The theory at this scale would only be like degrees of freedom for this particular example would be things, oh sure there's electrons, yes, photons, neutrinos, et cetera. Just going to write down a theory, none of these particles are there. They still have some effect and they, they, we have to figure out how to incorporate their effect. But the idea is just don't do it in the full standard model. Do it in a theory that only has the degrees of freedom that are light compared to the scale we're working at. So if we're calculating here, these are my degrees of freedom. If I go up to say, you know, B meson things, I'd have to include more things as light degrees of freedom, but I would still have some heavy ones too. This is the core idea. I'm gonna just forget the full theory. I'm gonna write down a theory that only has the light degrees of freedom. That's just step one. We can make this a little bit more formal, a little bit more mathematical. Um, we say that we get the EFT by integrating out heavy stuff. All right, we've all heard this term. It means various things to us. This, I'm gonna tell you what it means to me and it means in this context. So uh, the idea of integrating something out and why it's called integrating, or at least 
to me why it's called integrating, uh, sort of has a natural home in the path integral. We're not going to do a lot of stuff with the path integral because that's difficult. <laughs> uh, but it at least has a great uh, you know, conceptual device for, for what we mean here. So the idea is we're going to split our fields into phi heavy, phi light, phi h is the heavy degrees of freedom. So in the example I had put up here before, everybody above the electron. Phi light is the light degrees of freedom. Right? So I'm going to split them this way. And I'm going to imagine, here's my path integral. We've got L is a full theory that has both the heavy degrees of freedom and the light degrees of freedom. And I'm just going to replace this with a theory. Right? I didn't do the integral over the light stuff. Uh, that's going to be the same. of an effective theory that only has the light degrees of freedom. That's sort of mathematically exactly what I was saying right there. Or path integral, hand wavy uh, way of saying exactly what was above. And right, light and heavy is always relative. Light and heavy is relative to the scale that I'm interested in. All right, if I'm doing LHC physics, there's a different definition of light and heavy compared to if I'm doing, you know, B meson physics. Okay. What is this guy? This effective Lagrangian that has only the light fields. Well, it's got some part that's mass dimension less than four. Right? Kinetic terms, mass terms. Plus, then we're going to have a tower here. N goes from five, this is the mass dimension, to infinity. This is a whole tower of higher dimensional operators. So right, we know we're normalizable part, dimension less than four, that's there. We're gonna to add to it an infinite tower of higher dimensional operators. So here N is telling me the dimension, so N equals five is dimension five operator, suppressed by one power of this lambda, which I'll talk about in a second. N equals six, is lambda squared in the denominator, seven, eight, et cetera. So the N is controlling, and this way I'm writing things, so I'm gonna write this a lot. N is controlling the mass dimension of the operator, and I is the number of operators. So at dimension five, there may be more than one operator. That's what the I index is doing. Right. We all know how to count up mass dimensions of operators, scalars, or bosons, uh, and gauge fields have mass dimension one, or mass dimension three halves. We just pile them together, add them together. Derivatives have dimension one. We get a higher dimensional operator. How does this make sense with this gut feeling that we got up here? All right, all of a sudden we got pretty technical all in a hurry. The best analog of this that's not in a quantum field theory sense is think about a multipole expansion. You have some blob of mass charge, whatever, if you're very far away from it, you say, all right, it's just the monopole. I just get the dot there. It looks, you know, I don't notice anything else. It's a sphere. I zoom in a little bit closer. I start to see it has a dipole. Move in a little bit closer. I'm going to be able to see the quadrupole, octopole, etc. All of those things, as I get closer and closer, I resolve more detail of my object. That is exactly what's going on here. You can think about I can't cover my hand on it because you can't see that. Uh, this is just the longest distance stuff. That's like the monopole term of a multipole expansion. I zoom in, one over lambda, one over lambda squared is telling me something effectively, a dipole, quadrupole, et cetera. And we don't, we don't need QFT to do that. This is just doing the same thought, but with, you know, here are operators that we know and love. Couple of comments here. Uh, yeah, we do that right here. First of all, these operators are local. Local means derivatives in the numerator. We don't ever have any one over d, one over d squared. Remember, that means, why do we say local? Local says Fourier transform it. 
If it's got derivatives in the numerator, you're always going to get delta function. So it's an, it's an interaction only at one point. That's why we say local. As opposed to 1 over d, 1 over d squared, you're going to get long distance stuff. So if we're ever doing an EFT and you see derivatives in the denominator, something's really gone wrong, take a step back. Second, EFT comes built in with that thing, that scale there. This is not equal to a cutoff of loop integrals. All right, lots of times we put in a momentum space cutoff. That's not what this is. This is really a physical scale. This is a, which we can think of as approximately the mass of the heavy guys. Right? Say, I'm going to approximate this one over the mass of whatever my heavy field is. Right? It's not something that's just a, effect of how we cut off integrals. It's really a physical thing. It is the ceiling of your EFT. You can't go above that. This makes sense, right? The whole idea is I'm removing a degree of freedom to make this L effective. I, if I suddenly go to energies heavier than the mass of that particle, it doesn't make sense to not include that. So EFTs always come with a ceiling, and that's this physical cutoff lambda. All right. You might be staring at this, and I know it's tempting to, uh, to look at this and say, hold on a second. You sold me this argument on EFTs by saying, trust me, we're going to get a lot simpler. But then you introduce infinite terms. How is that at all simpler? Good question. Right? All right? It's not that the infinite terms are just totally chaos, no order to them at all. We see that it's an expansion in this parameter. So it's not just that there are infinite terms, we really have an expansion in one over the scale of the heavy thing. Right? So we can organize, we can group all the terms one over lambda, all the terms one over lambda squared, et cetera. So we have at least an organizing way of doing this. Um, since we're physicists, expansions in, we like things that are dimensionless when we expand in them. So a better expansion is really p over lambda. p is the momentum scale that you care about. Lambda is massive heavy particle. Let's write that down. Adam, there's a question in the chat. Oh, how yeah. am I seeing a question? I see Q and A. Is that different? Oh, uh, it's chat. I could mute uh -huh. it to you if you like. Yeah. Shouldn't the cutoff in a loop integral in EFT be the same as the maximum energy at which the EFT valid? We will talk about loops the next lecture hold on to that question you might think that and we will say that uh yeah cutoffs are a dangerous thing uh is the only way i'll answer that and stay tuned we'll talk about that not tomorrow but lecture number two so this first lecture we'll talk about tree level stuff yeah absolutely a valid question it's definitely something that is you know, sitting in the back of your mind listening to me uh but uh let me get to that uh, wednesday's lecture okay <laughs> Sorry, still not used to any of this. Uh, so our P over lambda is momentum I care about. And then this is the mass of heavy. And how does this work? Is that at any given order, There's only finite terms. So if I ask how many one over lambda squared terms are there, they are not infinite. It might be large, but it's not infinite. If I want to know how many lambda squared plus lambda cubed, still finite. The only reason we have this infinite is because I'm summing up all possible orders when I'm writing it that way. So at any given order, there's only a finite, important point number one, and then 
we only measure things to some accuracy. Let's call it delta. We go and measure something, LHC, LEP, your favorite collider. I don't know it infinitely well. I know it to some accuracy, 1%, tenth of a percent, et cetera. Therefore, if I care about calculating in my effective theory, you only need to keep P over lambda to some n such that la at lambda is greater than your accuracy. You don't need to go to expansions here that are so small, you never, you don't know them. Let's put some numbers in here. You're gonna learn from, or you'll find listening to me, I'm like analogies and the dumb examples are how my brain works. So if delta is 1% and P over lambda is a 10th, I have to go to N equals two. I don't have to go infinitely high. And since that N equals two, there can only be a finite number of terms. I'm not stuck. I don't have to deal with that fact that there's infinite number. I don't have infinite accuracy in any measurement. Therefore, I never need infinite terms. To whatever accuracy I have at collider X, Y, or Z, you're only going to need finite number of terms. That's why we can actually make it simpler, despite the fact that we still do formally, when I write down this scary looking expression, have infinite terms. The fact is you never need all infinite terms. Right, we can get a little more practice with uh, assigning powers of P over lambda. If an operator has, has mass dimension, capital D, then it enters into any amplitude as P over lambda to the D minus four. This is four dimensions. I'm only gonna work in four dimensions. All right. And you may know this from field theory. You may know this from playing around with something like the Fermi theory that, you know, it's a mid dimension five term comes with the power of P over lambda. Dimension six, P over lambda squared. Multiple operators. P over lambda to the sum, the individual operators, the mass dimension minus, or the sum of the dimensions minus four. These are the individual operators. So for example, if I need P over lambda squared, accuracy. This means I can put in two dimension five operators, dimension five giving me P over lambda, second dimension five, P over lambda, or I can put in one dimension six operator. Those are the same order in P squared over lambda. So two times dimension five or one times dimension six. And dimension here is normal mass dimension. Okay. This process that we're doing here assigning powers of P over lambda to individual operators and figuring out which ones I have to include in a given process or not, this is called power counting. Read any, pick up any EFT review, full of this word. And power counting, what we're doing, uh, yeah, it's just a, a you know, totally useful tool of the trade. Okay. All right. We've got it, we've got our operators, we've got our way of organizing them. How do I go in about and resolving what this means? I now know how to think about this. How do I think about this arrow? That will introduce our, our second sort of key term here. This effective theory is clearly not equal to the full theory. Right? It doesn't have the same degrees of freedom. That's sort of obvious, but even more so, it has different inputs. It does not renormalize in the same way. These are things that we're going to see. It's in general, it's just a totally different theory.
However, we can adjust inputs of this effective theory such that L effective and L full agree at low energies. Right? We're saying, go back to the very beginning here, instead of doing the whole standard model as just a sort of a toy example here, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate to my heart's content with just the theory of electrons, neutrinos, and photons. In order to make that at all viable, what I have to do is make sure the full standard model calculation and the theory with just light degrees of freedom, they have to agree. And we're gonna see this process is called matching. We have to make the two theories agree in the realm where the effective theory is valid. We don't care about above the effective theory. In fact, above the effective theory, you have no right doing the effective theory. But below the effective theory, your effective theory better agree with the full thing if it's supposed to be a faithful representation. Of it. Okay, now that we've sort of got our process here, full theory, effective theory, we know how to organize the effective theory. We know at least in words, we'll see in examples shortly, how, how to tie up the inputs. We can now take a step back and start to recognize some effective theories that are lingering all around us. We can recognize So yes, I've introduced this as a way with the path integral, light, heavy. The core of what's going on in the effective theory is that I have this sort of um, two scales here, right? Got a higher scale and a lower scale. So even if you want to take a back step and get out of field, get any of that, anytime you have a separation of scales, small scale, big scale, you can do effective field theory. It's going to look different than what I'm doing, which is pretty specific to quantum field theory, and I'll, I'll say in a second, you know, just a subset of EFTs, but the idea is there in general. Whenever I have separation of scales, P small compared to lambda, and I can expand in it, I can do effective field theory. Okay. Obviously, the smaller P is compared to lambda, the fewer orders I'm going to have to go into in order to you know, be able to match experiments. So we need separation of scale. So we can just identify some of these. Right, we've seen lots of these all our, not all our lives, but all our, uh, all our uh, QFT classes and in research, perhaps. Uh, let's just identify them. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, also, writing down references is really slow. So what I'm going to do is I'll annotate this afterwards before I upload it and I'll put in references, uh, at least the ones that I remember. And if anybody's curious about stuff that I left out, yeah, let me know. Obviously, the one that we are just, you know, learn first is good old Fermi theory. Lambda there was the mass of the W, right? You didn't have a mass of the W. And P was, you know, light particles that we had around at the time. So this is usually hadron lepton mass. Fermi and friends, for years, you can calculate perfectly well without knowing that really it was a standard model there because you could work in an expansion of P over MW. There is chiral perturbation theory. This is the theory of pions. Here, this is essentially GV, scale when QCD becomes confining, strong. P here is, you know, stuff around the pion mass energy. Small compared to this, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, this could be orders of hundreds, it could either be order of 0.1, it's still going to be able to make some predictions, do some good stuff. There's also called heavy quark effective theory. This is the theory of heavy light um, mesons, so a B quark and say an up quark, a B quark and a down quark, et cetera. So this is heavy light mesons.
There, this is typically MB. And P is again, you know, typical strong interaction scale. This lambda QCD, which we know is around, you know, a couple hundred MeV or a GeV. This divided by, uh oh. Get separation of scale, we can do great things. Um, there's even fancier ones. Soft collinear effective theory. This was originally developed for some things in the B meson system. I know very little, I've never worked in this. Uh, the context I'm familiar with it is this is at, for a jet at the LHC. There, lambda is just, you have some very hard collision at the LHC, so root S hat. Uh, and P is roughly the mass of, yeah, you know, a quark or a gluon that is technically massless. Okay, it's not once QCD happens, but um, we typically have a mass of some spray, some jet of particles. And this is going to be very small compared to hard collision scale. These ones have connections with sort of directly related to the standard model. But um, like I said, you really only need a separation of scales in order to have an effective field theory. So way beyond the scope of the standard model, you can have EFT basically for insert your favorite phrase here. There are EFTs for nuclear physics. There are EFTs for inflation. There's uh, EFTs for large scale structure. I don't know anything about these, so you can't ask me, well, I don't know very much about them. You know, I can't identify you the lambdas and p's in them. You can go ahead and, and find there's in there. Please feel free to dig into, I'll add references, dig, in, dig them out. Even, uh, you know, binary in spirals. I've got some neutron stars rating at each other. There's a scale, their separation that's large compared to the you know, radius of a neutron star. You can do this physics in those systems. And this list goes on and on and on. It, this is a, is a technique that you know, is a, you know, a crucial for a theoretical physics. It you know, manifests in different ways, but it, it's there. So in the little uh, standard model example, I had pitched to you at the beginning where I say, forget everybody at the, but the electron. I, there it was very easy to identify who's phi light and who's phi heavy. Who are the heavy fields and who are the light fields? Right? The electrons, could, uh, eat the light field. Even if I looked at the whole standard model, I could easily pick out who's light. But this transparency between light degrees of freedom and UV degrees of freedom doesn't have to be there for EFT to work. You don't need what I'll call degree of freedom transparency. A good example of this is look at the chiral Lagrangian for pions. The infrared degrees of freedoms are pions. I can't very easily draw a line and say that pion, well, that connects to this particle in the, the, the you know, ultraviolet theory, which is quarks and gluons. I can get sort of do some approximations there but uh, you don't require this. Uh, in fancier theories like soft collinear theory, uh, the same true, or a similar lack of transparency shows up there. A single gluon field, you split up different momentum components into what's a light degree of freedom and what's a heavy degree of freedom. Uh, so I don't need to be able to do that simple path integral and do that grouping in order to have EFT. Having a simple Lorentz invariant, easy to identify, connection between who's light and who's heavy makes it easier. Not a necessary ingredient, I want to stress that, just something that's there to make, uh, make it easier. So I'm going to focus on EFTs where I can do this, who's light, who's heavy, just in a nice Lorentz invariant particle is in yes or no way. But I want to uh, uh, stress that it's certainly not, not something that has to apply. Uh, if you would like uh, an excellent review on all of this, See Tim Cohen's review. He does goes through soft collinear effective theory and how it sort of a field that you thought used to be one thing splits up into many things. All right. So you noticed, you know, smeft the thing that I said at the introduction. This doesn't appear in our list. I, so the list that I've just said is what I would call bottom up. Or no, sorry, getting ahead of myself. The things that I wrote down, heavy quark effective theory, chiral Lagrangian, that's very top down. 
I wrote down my theory, which I'm imagining takes part in some lower energy regime of a bigger theme. You can also do bottom up. And the specific context that I'm going to imagine is we're going to take the standard model Lagrangian and I'm going to just add the same thing I'll write millions of times all possible deviations from the standard model. So this is all possible higher dimension operators, which we're going to view this as the result of integrating out something heavy. Here, I don't know lambda. Lambda is the goal of thinking about things this way. I write down the standard model. I write down every possible way that I could extend the standard model, keeping things like gauge invariance, that things that I, in Lorentz invariance, things we know and love, true. I just extend by all possible operators. I view data from the LHC, data from lower energy experiments in this context. And the goal of this is determine lambda. What is the heavy particle? What is the set of heavy particles that I need that would explain the data? So here, I don't know what's going on. I'm just using the EFT framework as a way for you know, covering all the bases and going ahead to look at the data and try to infer what is lambda. Both of these approaches are totally valid. Um, so this approach is exactly what the SMEFT is about. It's a framework which we're imagining coming from integrating out something heavy by studying all the operators that we get, and we'll make very sure, study, you know, be a lot clearer about what it means to study all the operators. Uh, the goal of this is to determine what's the UV physics. Uh, that's the bottom up approach for SMEFT. But uh, what's sort of going to dominate uh, this lecture, um, in the, at least and the next one is going to be thinking about this top-down approach. How do we do these things like power counting? How do we do these things like matching? And, and how do we incorporate loops to address things like this, this question we've got so far? So what I want to do next is um, do a simple example. But I've been talking for a while. I think you know, there's nothing more torturous than subjecting anybody to 75 minutes of me talking. Uh, I tried to listen to one of my own lectures that I delivered at, you know, just during the semester. Oh, it was torturous. So let's just all decouple our brains for a minute. Let me collect my thoughts. So I'll just start talking at 132 or 133. Sorry. Just get a drink, check email, whatever. And feel free to ask. Is it necessary to know the symmetries of the theory in the bottom up approach to write down the operators? Uh, no. I will talk about some symmetries and how they are sort of inherited into the EFT or not. Oftentimes, what you're probably getting at is we make assumptions about the UV in order to limit the number of terms that we would write down. For example, standard model has an approximate symmetry, which is baryon number. And you may say, let me assume that the UV physics also has baryon number. Then when I'm writing down my higher dimensional operators, I don't include anybody with baryon number violation. But that's an assumption. You don't know beforehand. So you can assume things about the theory and the effective theory takes different forms depending on what you know about the sim or what you assume about the asymmetries. But no, you don't have to, you can't. I have no idea if baryon number is a good quantum number of the ultimate theory of the universe. We only know it's very good in the standard model. All right. Let's um, dive in and do an example. I, I started to sort of sold this to you with the standard model. Standard model is way too complicated to try and get the points across. So what I'm going to do is write down a simple toy full theory. And then we're going to write down 
how we get to the effective theory from that. So the, the toy theory I'm gonna use is a simple Yukawa theory. So I'm gonna write L full. So we've got a scalar and I'm gonna consider this scalar is super heavy. In fact, for the stuff that I'm gonna do first, I'm just gonna neglect the fact that this fermion even has a mass. Right? The fermion mass is stuck in there because once we start doing loops, we don't wanna to to deal with any infrared stuff. So let's just neglect the fermion's mass. There's only finite number of uh, toy examples that you can do that are you know, insightful, maybe get the message across. So this is exactly the toy theory that Skiba uses. This was the, the uh, 2010 review. And it allows uh, somewhat, uh, you know, you got fermions and bosons in there. If you are to say, why would you even do that? Why not just look at just scalars for scalars only? This is what Tim Cohen did. I, now, Tim Cohen did this in 2018. So I'll, you know, update the Skiba from 10, 10 years ago. And I'll do some things differently than he does, of course. But there's only so many theories. Let's use this one. Here our scalar, this is the heavy guy. So our effective theory is gonna be one without that scalar. So L effective is just gonna be of this fermions itself. No scalars. In fact, the scalars are gonna be encoded in other places. So to match, what we want to do is calculate a process and the one I'm gonna choose is psi psi to psi psi. And we're just gonna work at tree level. And this matching has to be at some scale and we're gonna say it's at some scale mu m scale, mu m, which is approximately equal to the mass of that heavy particle. We're sort of matching the two theories where they're supposed to be both valid. So in the full theory, we have yeah, diagram like this, plus a diagram like this. The problem with toy theories, they're simple, but they often involve annoying things like cross diagrams. And I'm going to assume because it's been you know, beaten into my brain or I've always thought that, that P1 and P2 are incoming, P3 and P4 are outgoing. All right. So if I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the amplitude here, when we match, right, we don't match Lagrangian level. What we want to match is physical things, right? Physical things are what we measure. We don't measure Lagrangians. And that's gonna be a recurring theme comes up over and over again. Matching physical things. Physical things are amplitude. On shell amplitude. Professor O'Connell probably nailed this into your head. So let's calculate the amplitude for this process. All right, we said our Yukawa coupling was kappa. Right, this here is the interaction between those two heavy and light sectors. So this is minus I kappa squared, U bar three. I'm just gonna be, this is my shorthand, U bar P3, et cetera. And remember I neglected the mass of my fermion here just to make life easier. U1, bar four, U2. That's from this first diagram, I T channel exchange. And then this thing, which is going to play very little role here, is just swapping three to four in the second diagram. And what that's going to do is change T goes to U. Right? So that's just the second diagram. So what we want to do here is let's expand in that momentum, All right? This will organize our power counting. Remember our power counting was momentum. So here, this is, you know, P squared. P is roughly momentum's going around in this loop or in this loop in this process and M squared is mass of our heavy guy. So I need to 
find that infinite expansion, I need to expand in T. This is going to give me uh, just cleaning up lots of those factors of I. over m squared times one plus t over m squared dot 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 minus i'll just actually write it out this time u bar three u two u bar four u one so here we say by calculating the full theory and then expanding in powers of p squared over m squared I'm going to generate that full infinite series. So I have oops, minus three to four. And then I've got terms linear in these momenta. So I've got plus ik squared t dot dot dot. Uh, minus u dot dot dot, where you guys can fill in the details of any of that. And there are, of course, more terms. So here is something that's order p squared over m, uh, m squared. m here, mass of heavy particle. Remember, lambda, what we've said in our generic power counting, is always the mass of a particle. When we're doing this, I have the mass of the particle. So this is p squared over m squared. And this terms here, well, they have the 1 over m squared, m to the fourth. This is going to be order p to the fourth, m to the fourth. And I could keep going. So I've taken my full theory, calculated a process, do this expansion, generate the infinite terms. Goal in the EFT is now let's write down a higher dimensional operator that encodes this physics. Write down a higher dimensional operator that encodes this physics. What do I mean by encodes? It means gives me the same result for an on-shell amplitude. Often it's the case that you can do this identification of what operators you need just by eye. We'll do that first, but you can be a little bit more systematic. So we want to capture this. So let's write down the effective theory. Remember, it can only be psi and psi bar. Well, it should have a kinetic term for this. And I will claim and we'll see that we will get exactly the same physics by writing down a for fermion operator, psi bar psi squared, and d, d mu psi bar, d mu psi, psi bar psi. This is a term that has mass dimension six. This is a term that has mass dimension eight. You could ask, why did I pick only those? We'll answer this question in a second. Uh, but what do we notice? Coefficient, coefficient, those are inputs, right? The goal of the matching procedure is to determine what is C in terms of things in the UV theory. What is D in terms of stuff in the UV theory? Remember, L effective is a different theory. Its inputs are different. So if you go ahead and in order to match, I have to calculate the same process, psi psi to psi psi, with just the EFT Lagrangian. So there's going to be a Feynman rule for this, and there's going to be a Feynman rule for this. And it's, oh, it's pretty simple. They're going to look like this kind of process. We go ahead, put in the powers of I correctly, do the Feynman rules correctly. Again, somewhat annoying. We've got the same field over and over again. We would find that this is going to equal IC times U bar three, U one. The D term, 
right? This has got derivatives in it. So those derivatives, there's a couple different ways I can assign the derivatives. Hence why I've got a couple of different terms here. Um, but this is all straightforward. And you know, in order to get exactly the sign right, I've had to remember my convention about what momentum are, but that's sort of just a, a detail. The main message is I calculate in the EFT, got my amplitude. Now I want to equate this to the one that I got in the full theory. So right, here's our full result. That's not just screw around, change the colors. I want to equate that to what I've got over here. Uh, one thing to clean this up a little bit is that this simplifies to minus t, this group of momentum, right? p1 dot p3, that minus t over two, same as p2 dot p4. So I recognize I've got a term with no momentum dependence. I've got a term in the full theory with no momentum dependence. I've got a term in the EFT with momentum dependence t and this uh, big surprise or no surprise would be u. I've got some terms with momentum dependence. Full theory, I have terms with momentum dependence too. So matching, I'm just going to set them equal to each other. Momentum independent, full theory to momentum independent. Effective theory, linear power or of Mandelstam variables, full theory, linear power and effective theory. The theories match if we choose C to be not a big surprise, kappa squared over m squared, and D is minus kappa squared over m to the fourth. And when I was doing this matching, right, I expanded out my full theory just to one power of t. I could keep going t squared. In order to match, I would have to put in more stuff into my EFT. I could pick off the Mandelstam squared parts of the full theory, identify them with a higher dimensional effective theory operator, and keep going. So yes, this is Joyce's a toy theory. Uh, in one of the exercises, I put in a theory with just scalars, try your hand at matching but we have successfully matched. We did our first match, I mean, the first that we've done right here. Hooray. So this was a little fast, perhaps, uh, especially if you, know, if you haven't thought about these concepts in a little while. Uh, there's many questions that you might have. First is, you know, I just sort of asserted this. I said, well, you know, obviously here's the right thing that you would put in to match. Um, that is sort of the matching what I referred to as we just sort of matched by intuition. We kind of looked at the structure of the amplitude and went, yeah, you know, that's a scalar times a scalar. I should probably put in a phi to the um, four fermion term. That's got some momentums. Let's sprinkle some derivatives around. Um, or we just sort of took this diagram and, you know, imagined shrinking that propagator to a dot. It's another good way we could sort of approach it. But uh, you know, these are rules of thumb. We would like something that's a little bit more rigorous uh, in order to do this. So there's many other ways that we could have matched. I mean, at least procedures. In the end, we're gonna get the same answer, but there's some different steps. One way that we could have done things uh, that has a bit more connection with the path integral is I can imagine uh, just solving the equation of motion for our heavy field. Right? If you go ahead, calculate the Euler-Lagrange equations for that, you would find that phi is minus kappa d squared plus m squared psi bar psi. So if I then plug that back into the Lagrangian, I'm going to have, you know, Let's see here's where me getting the sign right is important. So here's the light stuff. Yeah, we're used to that. Here is the whole effect of solving the equation of motion. What have we done? We've really integrated the field phi in the path integral, right? We said, at least for this simple example, it's pretty simple. It's just a linear term and a quadratic term. I'm just doing that integral like we would do a normal Gaussian integral, right? Phi is at the end of the day, just an integration variable. And I get this mess. 
At this point, I've still made no approximation. Right? The whole full theory is still in this mess. But this is a mess. This is a non-local theory. I've got derivatives in the, in the denominator. So how we can make some connections with the EFT is now let me expand d squared over m squared. Now d squared over m squared is you know, minus p squared over m squared. I'm going to expand. You would get this is, that term's going to go there below from four. I'm going to get k squared psi bar psi. Uh, there's actually a two here. Two m squared. Psi bar psi squared minus k squared two m to the fourth psi bar psi d squared psi bar psi. So doing things this way, I didn't have to do any of this intuition. Hmm, smells like a product of scalar currents, etc. I just solve the equations of motion, which I you know I could do all calculations still in full theory with this guy. The EFT step comes here. I expand in powers of d squared over m squared, carry this thing out. This will allow me to easily get my um, coefficients in my effective theory. Here's my c, and this guy is roughly d. We'll talk about uh, exactly how we sprinkle derivatives around in a second. So can we take account loop corrections using equations of motion? The answer is yes. That is a very, very good question. All right, what I'm doing is definitely tree level integrating things out. You can, there's a whole approach that people have established of doing this. This is very path integral approach that incorporates loop corrections. Uh, I am not an expert on it. It is something I would like to mention towards the end of um, the um, last lecture. If you are curious of it, I will sprinkle some references. This is called the covariant derivative or to, to um, answer the question here, this is called the covariant derivative expansion, where you can take this nice path integrally equation of motion method and really put some muscle behind it, make it work, not just for a simple example, but work at loop level, work with tons of interaction. This is possible, called the covariant derivative expansion. I'll put some references in here. This is a very interesting, cool. If I had infinite time, what I actually did when I was said, I'm gonna become an expert on this and then teach it at Tazi. Well, <laughs> that part didn't happen. So I, at least I could still refer you to it. Um, but that, yeah, that's a very good question. So we've got this nice equation of motion method. We've got the gut instinct method. We could have also put in all possible operators. How did I know it was just, uh, yes, the equation of motion does work. I believe there's a paper by Tim Cohen and his postdoc, Xiaoshan Liu, who just did the covariant derivative expansion for heavy quark effective theory. I do not know the answer for soft collinear effective theory. That's a good question. But uh, I can put in that reference in some notes or we can talk about it in the discussion. That's a very nice, because this, this method has uh, evolved, become, you know, uh, attracted more interest since about 2014. So people are putting in work, it's a moving target, but uh, very good question. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, that's psi bar size, not the only dimension six term I could have put. I could have done things like, oh, you know, psi bar psi squared. I could have done psi bar gamma five psi squared. Uh, you know, we know all of these. There's five of them. I should put them all uh, for SMEF that absolutely does apply, yeah. Um, the question was, does this equation of motion method work for SMEF? Yes, the answer is yes, yeah, absolutely. That was sort of why it was brought back to light was to have it work there. Uh, you could have put in all of these coefficients. If you put in all of those co coefficients, your matching would have been more complicated because it's going to involve the coefficient of this, the coefficient of this, the coefficient of this. I would, or at least my effective theory is going to involve more operators. But if I still did this matching term to term, I would see to match what I got in the full theory, I would need only this guy, not zero. So we took a lot of shortcuts just because the problem was so simple. In general, you would either do one of this method or this is sort of include all operators when matching. You would either include all and see only which ones you need to turn on or which combinations to match the full theory, or you would do something like the equations of motion. Those are sort of more guaranteed to work, whereas the intuition method is nice for a toy example, but you know, kind of limited. 
um, the, at the derivative order, or at, sort of at the dimension eight. So here, as we know, there's a bunch of dimension six terms. How does it work at dimension eight? And the reason I want to do full theories, local equation, local theory, just get a non-local theory. How do I justify that? Um, full theory is local. I don't quite understand that. Uh, yes, you get a non-local theory, but it doesn't have all the degrees of freedom in it. And that's sort of why the non-locality there is representing that I don't have capital Phi in this equation. So if I'm not including the degrees of freedom as a thing that can be there, something's got to go wrong. And you know, if it was purely local and without phi and was the same as purely local and with phi, that's a problem. So if this is supposed to represent all physics, including physics with that field phi, something has to be there. And that thing that's there is that it's not local. So we started including all dimension six operators. We should do the same at dimension eight. And dimension eight is a nice segue into some other things, which I'll probably write out of, run out of time, and we can start with next time. Is um, right, there's different places that I can sprinkle derivatives. Right? If I want to include all operators, I should do d mu psi bar, d mu psi, psi psi. Okay, that's there. But I should also have d mu psi bar psi d mu psi bar psi. Sure, with both derivatives on psi bar. That's not Hermitian. I probably want to include derivatives on the other, on the sides as well. Uh, let's see, what else could I do? You do d mu psi bar psi, psi bar d mu psi. Or then I would even have some that look like psi bar psi, psi bar d squared psi. Um, so it is generally said that a low energy EFT can be matched to multiple high energy theories. How do I see that in the example that I mentioned? I don't quite understand the question. Uh, let's, um, let me just sketch out this, but we're talking about right here. Um, then I'll stay on and try and answer this question here. So let me push forward a few more minutes. Uh, well, and first lecture also, I'm just trying to gauge how fast I go. And I like the questions are flowing in now. That's really, really great. Uh, let me at least sort of set up the problem here, then we'll return to this. So what I'm trying to establish by writing all of these things down is there's a bunch of terms that I could add with extra derivatives here. Should I put them all in? Who oh, no. knows? The answer is that there are some redundancies we need to take into account. First redundancy is I can integrate by parts. Right? For example, if I have a theory that looks like d mu psi bar, psi, d mu psi bar, psi, I can remove this first derivative. I can exchange this for a total derivative. Right? Total derivative, we're not imagining any weird topology, nothing, everybody vanishes at infinity. Total derivative is gonna do nothing under those assumptions, which are some pretty good assumptions. Then that's just gonna say, forget the total derivative, I just spread around the derivative of other places. So that's gonna be minus d mu psi, oops, psi bar is still there. d mu psi bar psi minus psi bar psi d squared psi bar psi minus psi bar psi, d mu psi bar, d mu psi. And if we go back and we started to look at our lists, we would see that that means that anytime I write down this operator, it's not independent of these other ones. So an operator with this particular you know, sprinkling of derivatives, I can rewrite in terms of other operators, the sprinklings of derivatives. Um, so, we go back to our list and if I say, hey, there's technically four ways that I could sprinkle the derivative, it's not true. One of them can always be written in terms of the other three. So really now we're down to just three ways of writing down the derivatives. So integration by parts, we can always do. Again, it's with this assumption that, hey, we're imagining nothing crazy happens in infinity. It's a good assumption. Uh, we always have to take this into account. I can shuffle things around. 
And when we're doing this, the Lagrangian changes, right? If I had a coefficient C here, it's now spread out into other things. But the main important point that I want to drive home, and unfortunately falls in the middle of lectures here, is that we're gonna learn that Lagrangian operators by themselves, you may know and love them, but you can't assign any particular meaning to them. They are not physical things, right? Redundancies means, hey, this operator wasn't special because I could have written in terms of three others. So I shouldn't assign anything super special to the coefficient of this operator. What is important is that this physics and this physics are the same, so they're gonna generate the same amplitudes. So the key to redundancies. Brings up second redundancy, which is to let's look at this term. Right? That term looks a little bit funny because it's got d squared in it. And with some direct gymnastics that we're all sort of familiar with, you can rewrite this as psi bar uh, psi. Let me cheat here and call this d squared psi. Let's just shift where the derivative is the same sort of type of term. Well, this is equivalent doing some direct playing around to psi bar psi I got d slash squared d slash psi. Right? And we recognize this part. We know that you know d slash psi equals m psi. That's the equation of motion. Now it's the equation of motion, it's its dimension for Lagrangian. So is there anything we can do with that? It's a bit tricky because we're looking at fermions. So let me introduce a simpler theory that has the same kind of thing going on. Uh, then I'm just gonna state the uh, redundancy. We'll justify, we'll talk about some interesting things with it next time. So instead of having higher dimensional operators that have d slash psi, let's work in a scalar example. And let me consider a theory that's like this, minus and it has two phi squared, let's see phi cubed, d squared phi. All right, here's an example EFT, All right? I'm just writing it down, bottom up thing, and put in a sprinkling of higher dimensional operators, All right? Where it comes from isn't important. The point that I wanna to get to in order to talk about this redundancy is that one of the operators has the thing that we're used to seeing in the equation of motion, right? For a scalar, we know box or d squared plus m squared phi equals zero, right? Because there's no quartic term there. So I'm trying to establish that this kind of Lagrangian's got the same sort of weirdness that adding this term, right? It's got a piece, a higher dimensional operator, proportional to the combination of derivatives we're used to seeing in the equations of motion. How do we deal with this? Nobody wants to deal with d squared phi, right? That's an annoying Feynman rule. Uh, what can we do with it? The redundancy that we have, that we have left at our disposal that we haven't used, is that I can shift phi to phi plus delta phi. And this doesn't change physics. It will change the Lagrangian? Sure. It will not change things like S matrix elements. On shell amplitudes, the stuff that I can go out and compare to a measurement, will not change. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Specifically, if I make the change, phi goes to phi plus C phi cubed over lambda squared, I shove it back in there you will get a Lagrangian, you get L prime, call this L, that has one over d phi squared minus m squared over two phi squared minus m squared. The terms that I want to compare are using this redefinition, this term has become this term. So it looks like I've just taken any term with d squared phi 
and it turns it into minus m squared phi. This is a very interesting, extremely powerful, extremely you know, underrated and under thought about uh, invariance that uh, I will start with next time. Uh, the question we have here, this is specifically assuming a symmetry if we're changing that the physics doesn't change. Uh, no. The only limitation here is you have to have that, let's call this phi prime, it's still making the same particle, right? So I can't take phi prime equal phi squared. Right? But if phi prime is just shifting by some infinitesimal little piece, no. Your physics doesn't change. I will write down the reference of the general proof, but I just want to talk about this more because this is super important and super powerful. And it goes back to the message that I said with the integration by parts is that you may know and love your operators, but they can be shuffled around with these redundancies. So the things that you should care about are what you calculate with them, the physical things, which are the amplitudes. And so you should not be attached to any terminal Lagrangian. You should be attached to the uh, amplitudes. So uh, fortunately, bad timing by me, this redundancy falls right in the middle of breaks or between lectures, but we will pick up with this next time uh, and then go on to thinking about how we improve this by including some running effects. So I am going to be, where did I write this down? In the mu room. Hey, who ordered that? It's everybody's favorite lepton. I will be there at 3 p.m. Just we can talk about this. I'm sorry. Is it lambda of six or lambda? Of, oh, we should have lambda squareds everywhere. Yes, sorry. This is a total righto. Yeah, this is a lambda squared. I will be in the mu room for a discussion at uh, whatever time that happens. I'm on Eastern time. So uh, thanks for your attention right now. I'll stick around for, uh, I guess I am now your lunch. So I can stick around and answer questions for a few minutes, sure. Or I'm happy to, I will be there in the discussion today. Otherwise, tune in Wednesday afternoon. Uh, yeah, any other questions for Adam? Oh, and I should say that the, the coffee break starts in 1.5 hours. So whatever time zone you're in, that's an invariant statement. <laughs> OK, I'm not seeing any, unless someone is still typing, I'm not seeing any new okay. questions. I think there's one new question. Oh, yes, here's one. We can also stand, understand the del squared phi equals m squared phi. Typing. I, I think that's continuing, but the, the previous question oh. I think is still, is also new. Oh, no, you're right, absolutely. Sorry, I missed that. How is this different than using the equation of motion to replace the derivative? Uh, the result is the same. It is that, but the physics behind it is a field redefinition, right? That's what you're actually doing when you are re replacing the equations of motion in a higher dimensional operator. It is a field redefinition and why that's allowed is because of this statement. Physics doesn't change. So in a way this is safer than just going, hey, I'm gonna use the equation of motion. That's because right, just saying, hey, I'm gonna use the assume. equation of motion. That might be nice and it might clear stuff up, <laughs> but why are you justified in doing that is this reason. Right, because your phi's don't necessarily have to be on shell states later on. That's right. Nope. This right. is not restricted. Right. I will talk about this more next time. No. Uh, the fields are not. What can I say here? If the physics doesn't change. I am talking about on shell amplitudes. Yes. So then they are on shell. But this procedure, you can show, I can't show because I don't remember the proof. I will refer you to the proof that you can actually do this. This will hold at one loop too, or it holds at loop order too. Okay. Another question is coming, but Great. maybe I can. Maybe I can say this redefinition of the field is exactly the same thing you do in the counterturn transformation when you're going to define counterterms and to absorb divergences. Somewhat. In yes, absolutely. Yeah. Calculations. Because right. it's like you have the same Lagrangian. That's and, right. Phi, remember, yeah. is just a dummy field in a Lagrangian. You're doing or in an integral. And we can always mm -hmm. shift integration variables. Like, and all you need now, to do is still like create one particle states or annihilate one particle that's right. states. That's right. And you're happy. And you're happy. That's right. So yes, really the guts of this is phi is a dummy variable in a giant integral and we can change. Now, of course, there's always caveats and really some technical points, but for the most part, you can change variables as long as you reflect that it, and it will not change the answer of your integral. This is the QFT version of that.
So I'm gonna let's wait a, let's wait another minute for the the question in progress. Actually, for the, the people who know the technical side, is it possible to unmute students to ask questions? Yeah, so if, if anyone ever wants to do that, uh, they can just click the raise hand button and we can unmute them. That might be faster, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Alexandria, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I guess, uh, is another way of seeing this that um, we could insert the Fourier transform of phi and then D just becomes uh, like IP or minus IP or whatever. Um, and then from there, we would see that that operator is suppressed by an additional factor of P squared over lambda squared, which is what we're taking to be small. Uh, is this, um, uh, yes and no. I mean, it's not the fact that P squared over lambda squared is small that's making this true. Uh, you do need the fact that that D squared becomes P squared um, in the actual how you're caring about that this field transformation. This will be a little bit clearer when we, I, I actually do it out. Uh, I'll do this to start next time. Um, but uh, yeah, the fact that P over lambda is, not, is small isn't, uh, um, it does play a role if you try to go and learn a loop stuff, but for this, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I have something similar question to the one asked just now. I mean, so I can think of the equation of option del squared plus m squared phi mm -hmm. is equal to zero. That's the that's the equation of motion. If I include this, if I ignore the higher order operators, right? Yep. So, so in a sense, when I'm making the making the substitution of del squared phi is equal to m squared phi, I'm just writing down my Lagrangian again, just keeping the or uh, term still order open by lambda squared in a sense, right? Um, yes, this does remind me, I didn't quite explain this entirely. This, when we do these things, this one does not change physics up to order one over lambda to the fourth. Um, so if I want to get things to one over lambda squared correctly, the equation of motion that I used is fine. If I want to go higher than that, I have to change this. I can't use the free equation of motion. So if I wanted to get everything to one over lambda to the fourth, remove all derivatives that way, I would have to include uh, some other effects there on the, on the right. So, so in, in, in that picture, I don't really have to do any re redefinition, right? I mean, I can just say that, okay, through this order, I can just use my equation of motion. Uh, but why can you just use the equation of motion? What physics tells you that you can do that? I'm telling you it's a field redefinition that is the reason why you can do that. This field redefinition invariance is the reason that we can just say, oh, P squared equals, or D squared equals M squared. I mean, just saying I can use, I don't know what's the principle for just saying, looking at an operator and crossing stuff out other than this. Right? If I'm including an operator, I mean, those things can be, you know, they don't have to do anything with the equation. They don't have to be on shell things, right? But this is saying, I do a field redefinition, I can remove for all phi's, d squared, turn them into m squareds. So, so is what you're really doing there actually solving the Euler-Lagrange equation, or like writing down the Euler-Lagrange equation for phi, and the reason you put the zero on the right-hand side is that you're neglecting terms higher order in phi? Yes. Okay, okay, so this is an approximation, good well, only right. to a it's, certain order in lambda. That's right, which is the only thing we okay. ever care about in an EFT-based study, right? I want to get, I want to look at this operator with one over lambda squared stuff, and I want to, just because I don't like d squareds in operators, I want to remove them. I know I can always switch that over to m squareds uh, up to changes that are happening at lambda to the fourth. So now if I go and look at lambda to the fourth, I might have to do a second field ray definition to get rid of d squareds and stuff divided by lambda to the fourth, but I can keep iterating this. You can keep doing those field redefinitions order by order and clear, clean up the whole Lagrangian to put it into any particular form that you like. Thanks, I'll have to think more about this. I don't think I'll actually get the whole thing, but thank you. Sure, no problem. 
Uh, we'll start with this again because uh, it, it's not something people encounter a whole lot. It's super powerful. Uh, and it leads to a lot of people doing, you know, assigning overly assigning importance to individual operators in the world. Right. Great. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you, Adam. Um, so just, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the coffee break starts in one hour and 15 minutes in the EMU and Tau rooms. And the last lecture of today, which will be 